hymnals, which you can find on the inside front cover of the hymnal or on page 94. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. <coughs> Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly content. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. We sing as our gathering hymn number 673, God, who's almighty word. 673. <laughs> Let us pray. 
with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord God, with endless mercy, you receive the prayers of all who call upon you. By your Spirit, show us the things we ought to do, and give us the grace and power to do them. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The congregation may be seated. We invite all children, young and old, to come forth for the children. Greetings. Hi. How's everybody? Good, good, good. Parker, we saved a spot for you. All right, so I have something I would like to show to you today if you are okay with it. I have this bottle. Does anybody happen to know what might be in this bottle, especially somebody who might be good at reading things? Yeah? Sea salt grinder. Sea salt grinder. This is my sea salt grinder. Yeah, so this is salt. Has anybody ever had salt before? Yeah. Yes, probably, yeah. What things do you like to have salt on? Um, watermelon. Watermelon. Corn. <laughs> corn. What else? Am I like on popcorn? I like granola steak. You steak, sure. Steak. Yeah. Steak. On eggs, okay. How about, am um, I like salt on pretzels? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so salt makes all kinds of things taste really good, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, by itself, food might be kind of plain, but you reach the salt and all of a sudden, oh, that tastes really good, huh? Um, so let me ask you who have had some experience with salt. Um, if, say, I've got like a plate of steak or eggs or something like that, do I just like hold this over top and go, whoa, 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 and like, does it make the food taste better just like that, holding it over there? What, how, do I, how do I get this? How do I make it taste better? I turn it like this, huh? Now, this is a grinder, so even if I turn it upside down, there won't be a whole lot that comes out unless I grind it. Look, you can even see the crystals right there. Look at that. Now, yeah, yeah, we're not gonna eat it right now. Later on. Anyway, so you can see those little tiny crystals, right? Right? Yeah. So, here's something really, really, really important about how salt works. It's not just keeping it in the bottle. As long as I keep it in the bottle, it cannot make my food taste any better. But when I turn it upside down and grind it and put it on my food, when I put the salt out there, and then all of a sudden it can make things taste better and come to life. So if you want salt to actually do something, it can't just stay in the little bottle forever. You've got to use it, right? Obviously, right? Can I say that? That's just obvious, right? Okay, so my reason for telling us this and making sure that I know how to properly use my salt grinder is Jesus has this interesting thing to say about us, his followers. He says, you all are like salt for the whole world. We're here to make the whole world like taste better, to, to make the world better just by our presence in it. But that means that we can't just stay all in one place. Like that's why we don't just like live inside the church, right? We don't we don't all stay here, right? Even the pastor doesn't like sleep under his desk here, right? We all once we're gathered here, that's great, but then we're scattered out into the world so that we can bring God's love to other people, so that your presence, your words of kindness, you're telling other people about God's love can help make other people feel better and know that they're loved by God too. So when we gather here today, we should be real clear. We're not like impressing God. It's not like God says, I want you to just come and sit in the building. That's what I need. No, we come here to remind ourselves for God to remind us about how much he loves us and the whole world so that then we can be sent out into the world, scattered like salt all over the plate of corn or watermelon or steak or eggs or all of the above. That's why when worship is done and Sunday school is done, we don't just stay here all the time. No. We go out into the world where we can share God with other people. So there's the mission for each of us. And I'm going to dare you, and I'll try and dare to do it too this week, to see if I can find somebody, if you can find somebody, to tell that God loves them and maybe make the world a better place, like salt being taken out of the grinder and out into the world. Think you can find somebody to tell them that God loves them this week? Yeah. Yeah? All right. So we got a deal. You're going to try it? You're going to try it? Should we make the grown-ups try it too? Yeah. Hey, grown-ups, guess what? You're also salt for the world, and God is sending you to tell somebody else this week that God loves them. And just by your presence in the world, you'll be like salt for the world, making everything else taste better. All right, can we pray together right where we are? Will you join and pray right where you are too? Dear Jesus, we hear your call to us that we're salt for the whole world and that we can't stay in the salt shaker then. That you send us out into the world to be your presence of love for a world that needs to hear it. So help us. Help us to be brave and to find somebody else in our lives this week that we can tell about your love. And help us to trust that you're sending us with what we need so that as we go into the world, we'll feel like little grains of salt being scattered into the world to do your work. 
Thank you for your love that promises to go with us. We love you too, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for coming up. to manage their affairs with justice, for they will never be shaken, for the righteous will be kept in everlasting remembrance. They will not be afraid of any evil rumor. Their heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their heart is established and will not shrink until they see their desire upon their enemies. They have given freely to the poor, and their righteousness stands fast forever. They will hold up their head with honor, the wicked will see it and be angry. They will gnash their teeth and pine away. The desires of the wicked will perish. Second reading is 1 Corinthians verses, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. A reading from 1 Corinthians. 
When I came to you, brothers and sisters, I did not come proclaiming the mystery of God to you in lofty words or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and you crucified. And I came to you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. My speech and my proclamation were not with plausible words of wisdom, but with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might rest not on human wisdom, but on the power of God. Yet among the mature I do not speak wisdom, though it is not the wisdom of this age, or of the rulers of this age, who are doomed to perish. But we speak of God's wisdom, secret and hidden, which God decreed for the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the human heart conceived, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit, for the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For what man being known, what he, what is truly human, except the human spirit that is within? So also no one comprehends what is truly God's except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the gifts bestowed on us by God. And we speak of these things in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual things to those who are spiritual. Those who are unspiritual do not receive the gifts of the spirit, for they are, they are foolishness to them, and they are unable to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Those who are spiritual discern all things, and they are themselves subject to no one else's scrutiny. For who has known the mind of the Lord so, that, so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. God keeps going. God speaks seed, be seas, land, be land, 
skies be sky, and they come into being exactly as God intends. But when God says sky, you don't end up with chopping cards. When God says sea, you don't end up with a swimming pool. Exactly what God intends comes into being exactly as God speaks, and then God's just getting started. From there, as the storytelling goes, God speaks to individual beings and, and creatures, plants and trees and animals and porcupines and echidnas and tardigrades and even to human beings come into existence, and by God's calling humanity into existence, there we are. To be clear, existence itself is a gift of God's grace. You can't earn your existence, right? It's handed to you as a free gift. So God doesn't call the things into being as a reward for being good. They don't exist until God speaks them into being our mere existence. The fact that there's a you or a me is a sign of God's sheer creative grace that speaks things that don't exist into being. Fair enough? Fair enough. This is how God creates. Now, human beings don't have that kind of power and authority. I can't make a universe just by saying so. I can barely get my kids to finish their dinner in my house. <laughs> but we do have this amazing power, we human beings, through our speech, similarly, to bring people more to life or to tear people down, even in simple, small, little ways. It could be as simple as, as calling somebody by the name they prefer to be called by. Uh, when, when, when I was uh, grown up, my brother's name was Jonathan, and when he was real little, um, everybody called him Johnny, and I was Stevie back then. And they were fine when we were five, and now, though, he goes by school name Jonathan, and we gather together as a family for, say, uh, Christmas or Thanksgiving or something like that, and poor Johnny slips out of someone else's mouth to get this glare from him. That's not who I am. Call me by my proper name. And it's, it's funny, if, if I accidentally let it slip, and I rarely do anymore, but man, all of a sudden, it's like I'm belittling him like I'm treating him like he's this little kid, but to call him by his full name, Jonathan, has this way of making him swell up. Yeah, that's who I am. Or the flip side, when I was in elementary school, there was a girl that I knew as Stacy, and on the first day of school every year without fail, a new teacher would read off the list of official names on the chart and call Anastasia, and she would blush and go, that's me, but I'm really, hey, call me Stacy. And Anastasia is a beautiful name, it means resurrection, but when you are in elementary school and you just want to fit in with everybody else and there's not another Anastasia around for a mile, you would just like to be the name that someone has heard of before, and it meant the world to her, just to call her by her nickname, Stacy, rather than Anastasia, that would come in a later time. In a similar way, maybe even more deeply, you probably know what it's like. The power there is, especially for children, in calling out who they can be. So to tell children, you're good, you're creative, you're clever, I appreciate your sense of humor, you're kind, it brings that out of them. It, it, it's, it's there maybe inside, but until somebody calls it out and says on a regular basis, you know, I'm really impressed with how mature you are, how brave you are, how kind you are, how helpful you are. It helps them to become exactly what you call them out to be. It's not quite God's power speaking the universe into being, but there is awful power, amazing power in speaking to somebody, especially a child, and repeated over and over again repetition. You are good. You are kind. You are helpful. And watching how they become what you say they already are. And on the flip side, what terrible power there is if we use those words and consistently tell, especially children, you're lazy, you're a pest, you're annoying, would you caught? quit being so rude, would you not interrupt? It, it is so possible to tear kids out of all they have heard is you're not good enough, you're not smart enough, man, you're never going to get picked, you're not good, you're not responsible. It's fine to call out individual actions and say, this thing you said, that was rude. But that's different than saying you are rude over and over and over. You are irresponsible. Eventually, kids will leave what people who they trust as authorities tell them about themselves, and they become what we say they are, for good and for ill. There's amazing power, even at just a human level, but certainly at God's level, speaking things into existence and telling things what they are. It has the amazing ability, calling something by its deepest essence to become what you say it is. So, with that in mind, consider what it means that Jesus, just beginning his public ministry, gathers a bunch of anybody's onto the hillside. People who don't have a long track record yet of following. These are people who, as Matthew tells it a couple of sentences ago, mostly fishermen and tax collectors doing their day job. These are people the empire views as, um, at, at best, a nuisance. People to be 
conquered. Subjects will be dominated, and at worst, troublemakers they'll make an example of if they think they are getting in the way. People that the respectable religious folks at the time will look down on because they're not as devout and pious as they are in the way they keep all the religious rules. Jesus gathers these people, this, this crowd of anybody's, who don't even have very long of a track record to be showing what good, faithful disciples they'll be. And Jesus speaks to them and says, You are salt for the earth. You are light for the world. You'll note that's all speaking what things are and not what they could be. Jesus doesn't say, hey, everybody, I've got these five steps, and if you follow them, you too could become salt for the earth. He doesn't say, if you follow me for three years and do the following things that I list you, you could earn the rank of light for the world. This is not like kids earning merit badges in South. This is not working your way up to the honor roll. This is Jesus declaring who they are with the same authority that the living God has in the beginning of creation. Saying, light, come into being and be light. And it does. Jesus doesn't talk to us in the conditional but like a good grammar teacher might tell you, but in the indicative mood, saying how things are, telling us who and what we are, that we might become what Jesus says we are, like God speaking to the light in the universe that comes into being, like God speaking to creation and the seas and the sky and the plants and the animals and the humans and Uncle Fred and Aunt Edna come into being. Jesus speaks with that same kind of authority, saying to the people who anybody else would just call a bunch of nobodies, says, no, you are salt. So let's get that clear from the beginning. Jesus has not come here to give us a pep talk and list here possible rewards or ranks you might achieve if you work hard enough. He's here to say, I'm declaring you are salt for the world. You are light for the earth. Okay. What exactly does that mean? Because metaphors are slippery little critters and they can be just by anything. Well, okay, let's, let's unpack this a little bit. What do these two very different substances have in mind? Salt, so little crystals of rock that you eat, and the radiant energy that comes through outer space from the sun, or the light that comes from the land. What do these things mean? What, what, is, what does Jesus mean when he calls us salt or light? For one, I would note that for both of them, their presence in the world gives itself a way to make things around them better. But neither of them is there to dominate or to overpower. In Jesus' world, in Jesus' day, salt is like we still use it today, something for seasoning, for, for flavor. It's also something you use to preserve so that meat doesn't go rancid, to make food last longer. In a world that doesn't have all the artificial preservatives that we either are blessed with or cursed with, salt is a pretty decent way to make things last, to make them not go bad, to preserve things. It's used as an antiseptic, something to prevent disease or infection. And it's there not to overpower, but to make things more fully themselves, to make things more, to make things better, to bring out the best of what they are. When you are cooking with salt, even to this day, the goal is not that everybody look and go, mmm, you can really taste the salt. The idea is it brings out the other flavor. So if, we, if you put salt on your chicken or your steak or your noodles or your corn or your watermelon or whatever, the goal is not to get, mmm, you can really taste the salt, that's your secret ingredient. But oh, it brings out all the other flavors, somehow it enhances even the of the melon. Somehow it brings out the tomatoes in your sauce. Any of those things is there not to dominate, not to overpower so that it's the only flavor, but to help everything else be better, be more fully itself. Same thing with the way Jesus pictures light. Jesus did not live in the era of electric light. and certainly not the blaring billboards that uh, cause light pollution when you're driving down the road, enjoying a beautiful starry night sky, then to have the electric light blaring all over the place. Jesus lives in a world in which light helps you see other stuff Better. And isn't that so much how it is? That most of the time you're not staring at the light source, that will hurt your eyes. But you're able to see the world more beautifully. Even things like the sunrise or sunset, part of the beauty, most of the beauty, is in the way the sun's light makes the clouds turn all those other colors, the purples and oranges and yellows, along with the light from the sun itself. It's how it illuminates other things. It makes other things better, makes other things more fully itself. It's not there to dominate. If all you see is light, it hurts your eyes. But light that bounces off of other things allows you to find what you're looking for to see your place. In the world in which Jesus lives, where there's no electricity at night, if you get up in the middle of the night and you're looking for where to put my keys or my sandals or whatever, you light a little lamp that gives just enough light for you to see around the house. It's not big, giant, obnoxious billboards. It's enough to help illuminate other things. When Jesus talks about being a presence that lights like salt for the earth or light for the world, it's not that he's envisioning his community will take over and conquer and dominate and will decree everything, but that our presence is meant to be this life-giving thing that makes other things better, that brings other things more fully to life. And Jesus, again, says, you 
are this. I'm sending you out into the world to be this kind of presence in the world. Not that you must earn it or achieve it or accomplish it. It's yours already. Be what I'm calling you to be. Be what I tell you you already are. Okay, preacher, I can follow you. This isn't about earning or uh, getting a, a merit badge or rank or status. As God says, I already am salt to the world. God says, I already am light for the earth. That's like this presence of giving myself away to the world to bring things more fully to life. Okay, but what, what, what exactly would that look like? Okay, fair question. Again, metaphors are slippery things. So it's a good thing that we don't just have this handful of images from Jesus and then you're on your own to figure it out. I mean, if that's all we have, my goodness, we, we have no clue. If all we have is Jesus said, go be salt and light, you're on your own to figure it out. I don't know. <laughs> Am I supposed to give people high blood pressure? <laughs> it's why we get these beautiful words that we heard out of Isaiah today, too. And Isaiah stands in for all the prophets as well, who have this consistent vision of what it looks like to live in God's presence of soul and light for the world. Isaiah is speaking to a group of people who are trying to impress God with their religiosity, who would like them to be the stars in the center of attention with the light they think they are glaring to the world. And they are trying to impress God and their neighbors by their shows of religious piety, having big old national days of prayer and fasting and religious rituals, and they think they are impressing God with it. And God calls them out and goes like, I do not need you to have a big fast day. I don't need you to dress up and pretend you're sorry. I don't need you to shout your prayers. I don't need you to have a big old national day of prayer and fasting. Think what I actually would like, if you're going to go to the trouble of not eating, is what if you would take some of that food you're not going to eat today and share it with your neighbor so your neighbor doesn't go hungry. And God goes on to say, here's the fast I'm really interested in. If I'm not interested in you putting on a big spectacle that will draw attention to yourself, that's not how a light is supposed to work. I'd like you to be the kind of people who improve things for people around you. So the prophet then lists off things like, what if you shared your bread with the hungry? What if you welcomed the homeless poor and opened your doors to them? What if you helped people who were being oppressed or who were um, being trampled on by their employers? What if you helped people to be able to earn enough that they could feed their families? What if you spoke out wherever there's injustice? What if you were compassionate and kind and where people are going without essentials, you offered what you had to them? And then the prophet says, then your light will break out like you don't have light and you all over again. In other words, our presence in the world isn't meant to conquer or dominate or one of the bosses look how great we are. We have these small acts that season the world, that make it more fully itself, that bring the flavor out, that bring the goodness out of what's around us, like salt does in food, like light does illuminating a house or a room. It's a small, quiet presence that simply by giving itself away wherever it's put makes things better. That's our calling. That's who we are called. And again, Jesus did not hand this out to us and say, if you work hard enough at it, maybe one day you'll attain the rank of salt. Maybe one day you'll achieve being like you already are it. What would it look like for us? So maybe it will look like if you've got the skills to cook something, to be the person who makes soup next week for the soup sale for the American Cancer Society, so that someday maybe someone won't lose a loved one to this terrible disease. Or somebody right now will know in one more small way they aren't alone because other people are supporting them. It may be that when it's our turn again to house a homeless family to a family promise or to bring meals to them again, there's that sense of, yeah, that's how I could help my neighbor. That's what it looks like we saw or like. I don't need to draw a whole lot of attention to myself to do it. It's just how can I be a presence of God's goodness and love for the people around me in my neighborhood. It doesn't have to be an official churchy activity either. It could be you going out of your way to think, who are the people in my life who could use a word of encouragement, who could use a phone call or a note? Who are the people I could stop and simply listen to? Who are the people in my life who might be just a small reflection of God's goodness into their lives? And to do that, not because I hope someone's watching and I'll get extra credit, but because you already are God's presence of light for the world. I don't have for you a list of ten things you're supposed to do to make God give you the rank of being salt or light in the world. Because Jesus says you already are it, and I could undo it if I wanted to. You already are salt for the world. You already are light for the world. All we can do is take that seriously and ask, what would it look like then in the world that I step into? What would it look like when we leave the salt shaker? What would it look like when we leave the, the wick of the lamp? What would it look like for us to bring small, bring a small taste of God's goodness to other people around us? Not because we're trying to impress anybody, but because we're simply being what God says we already are. If we dare to believe that Jesus has the same kind of authority as God speaking creation into existence, and I'm convinced he does, 
then we are already given our fullest sense of who we are. You are salt for the world. You are light for the world. All we can do in response is to trust what Jesus says about us already and to dare to become what we are. The congregation rises as you're able, as we sing our hymn of the day, number 712, Lord whose love and humble service, 712.
Let us bring our prayers to the church, to the world, and all people in need. Each petition this morning ends with the words, Lord, in your mercy, and you're invited to respond. Hear our prayer. Your light springs forth like the dawn, O God. Call your church to share the mystery of your grace with a broken and searching world and enable us to become who you say we are. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Increase our care for the earth and all its creatures, Lord. Help us to reflect your light in our use of these good gifts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You care for the weak and the strong, O God. Raise up leaders who will free the oppressed in all places. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Quickly send your healing for all who are in pain. Especially we lift up to you today, Dave, Barry, the families of Ben Austin, and Dorothy Adams, those we name out loud or silently in our hearts. Feed the hungry, shelter the homeless, and enable us to use our resources, energy, and lives to be your instruments, to be your hands and feet of mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Give light and life to this gathering that we may delight to know your ways and share them with a the world longing to know you as you send us from this place to be salt and light. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Satisfy our needs until we gather with all your saints from every time and every place in your glorious light in that resurrection feast which has no end. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Radiant God, hear the prayers of your people spoken or silent for the sake of the one who has made his dwelling among us. Your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also, and also with you. We're invited to share a sign of Christ's peace with one another before we receive the offering. Peace.
from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now, Lord, be
body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, strengthen us to serve all in need and to give ourselves away as bread for the hungry. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing as our sending hymn, number 866. We are marching in the light of God. And the note the bottom of the second page says we'll do marching, then dancing, praying, and singing. 